Hey everybody, in this next video lesson, we're going to take a dive into chapter 13 in the textbook, and it's all about solutions. Now we're going to be talking first about factors that affect solubility. In other words, things that tell us whether or not a solute will dissolve in a solvent. Now the solute could be solid or liquid or gas, and the solvent could be solid, liquid, or gas. And solid solutes dissolving in a liquid solvent might not necessarily behave the same as a gaseous solute dissolving in a liquid solvent, but we'll talk about those differences based on the states of matter as they come up. But the first thing we're going to talk about is the solute-solvent interactions. Now, in order for a solute to dissolve in a solvent, first and foremost, they have to have similar polarity. You might have heard the term before that like dissolves like. What that means is that something that's polar in form of solute will only dissolve in a polar solvent. Now that includes ionic solutes as well, polar and ionic. Ionic is just an extreme polar situation. And so polar slash ionic will dissolve in a polar solvent. Now the same is true with nonpolar dissolving in nonpolar. There are nonpolar solutes that will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. But as you will learn on the next couple of slides, there are some molecules that have parts of it are, that are polar and other parts that are nonpolar. And we need to be able to kind of talk about to what degree something will dissolve or will not dissolve. Because it's not just an on-off switch. It's not black and white. It's not yes or no. There are some cases where things are kind of soluble. We call it slightly soluble. And it, a lot of it depends on the shape of the molecule, which is what I'll help explain to you using some pictures on the next couple pages. But for the most part, polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, the polar and nonpolar will not dissolve. Now, just because something is ionic, which is an example of an extremely polar compound, doesn't necessarily mean that it'll dissolve in water. Because really, when ionic substances are introduced to a polar solvent like water, the ionic substance has a decision to make. Is it more stable staying together as a solid in its ionic solid state? Or is it more stable if the ions break up and form the ion-dipole interactions with water? Now, if the ionic substance prefers or is more stable in its solid state, then it will not dissolve. Nothing says that ionics have to dissolve in a polar solvent like water. It's just that that's possible. Now, we've come up, we being chemists, have come up with something called the solubility product constant or KSP, which basically is a number that describes to what extent an ionic salt will dissolve in water. The numbers range from very, very large to very, very small. Now we don't really concern ourselves with very, very large numbers because very, very large numbers are soluble and soluble is soluble. What we really concern ourselves about is with the small numbers because these numbers tell us how likely something is to not dissolve. The smaller the number, the less likely it is to dissolve. Now these numbers get so small in the order of magnitude of like 10 to the negative 25th power. Now we'll go into what these numbers really mean in a future chapter, but for now I'm just going to introduce to you the concept of KSP and that it's a number that tells us to what extent an ionic salt will dissolve. Big numbers, very soluble. Small numbers, not soluble and some numbers in the middle are slightly soluble. You're looking at a table of KSP values at 25 degrees Celsius of some various substances, all of which are considered insoluble. Now again, these numbers really don't mean anything to you, but they are calculatable numbers, and we'll talk about how you calculate those in a future chapter. But I just wanted to show you that these numbers can get really, really small. The smaller the number, the less soluble. You could use these values to compare two substances. Now again, I said that these substances are considered insoluble, but if you took two substances that maybe are both with silver as the cation and you compare silver chloride to silver bromide, the one with the smaller value is less soluble. Let's just say this. All substances are soluble on some level. Even if it's just a handful of atoms, they will dissolve. But Insoluble substances tend to stay more as solid than they do dissolve. Insoluble substances, you couldn't see it dissolve because it's so little amount. 
but they do dissolve. Whereas soluble substance, it was very obvious that it did dissolve because some of the solid dissolved into the liquid. And so you could compare two numbers on this table and say, well, one of these is less soluble than the other, and the smaller the number, the less soluble. Here's a table that I took from the book. And what you have is a bunch of alcohols. And you notice that as you move down this list, you increase the carbon chain on the alcohol. Now they all end as OH on the end, which is why they all have the O all, which is why they all have the all ending in their names. All alcohols end as all. But the amount of carbons that are before the OH are basically telling you what the identity of that alcohol is. Now, as you can see, these first couple alcohols are infinitely soluble in water. You can dissolve as much as you want into water, and they will never be considered insoluble. But right around here, once you get to four carbons in butanol, you start to see some limited solubility in water. And in fact, as you increase the number of carbons in the chain, it becomes less and less soluble. Now, I mentioned before that this is, these are all polar substances. If you didn't know any better, just simply looking at the OH on the end, because all of those OHs basically end with a pair of electrons bonded to a hydrogen. And you're like, ah, aha, a pair of electrons. Yeah, that's polar for sure. But just because there's a polar part of a molecule doesn't mean that the molecule is entirely polar, as you can tell by the data that shows its solubility in water. You see, molecules are affected by something called charge density. And if you have a polar part of a molecule on a very small molecule overall, well, it's more likely to show its polar characteristics. In other words, it has a polar part spread out over a small mass of molecule, then it's considered to have high charge density and thus more polar. But if you dilute that polar side of a molecule over a larger molecule overall, then you dilute the density of that charge and it becomes to act less and less polar as you can see on this example of these alcohols in water. As the molecule chain gets bigger, the polar end shows less and less of the polar character of the molecule and eventually becomes so small that it is considered nonpolar. So in summary, a molecule may be polar, but you have to consider the size of the whole molecule in order to decide if that charge is diluted into a lower density. And if it's a low density charge, then it's more likely nonpolar. But another way to take what appears to be a nonpolar molecule, even though it has a polar end over here, let's say we put another alcohol end on this side. And now you see that this hexanol has actually two polar ends, and that hexanol with two polar ends has a higher charge density because you have more polar ends divided by the same mass compared to the original hexanol, which had just one alcohol or one polar end on the same size molecule. So that's another way that you can increase the charge density by decreasing the mass or by adding polar parts to the molecule. No, I forgot to mention the second column of this table, but C6H14 is called hexane. And hexane is a nonpolar liquid. And so methanol, which is very highly polar, it's got a polar OH and its charge density is very high because the molecule is quite small. It is not very soluble in hexane, which is a nonpolar molecule. But as you increase the chain of carbons, it becomes less and less polar. And as you can see, as soon as even the second carbon gets added to the chain, it all of a sudden has more nonpolar characteristic and thus can be soluble in something like hexane. Now that we've discussed how things dissolve in other things, let's talk about something called saturation, which is basically the maximum amount of solute that could dissolve in a solvent. And so you can dissolve solute and solvent up to a point, and eventually there's not enough room between the solvent particles to add any more solute. That is what is referred to as the saturation point of a particular solvent. Now, solute-solvent combinations have different saturation points depending on the solute and solvent you use. Most saturation points are measured 
in grams of solute per milliliters of solvent. For example, NaCl can dissolve in water, and you can get about 384 grams per liter of salt in water. It's also worth noting that the saturation point is temperature dependent, because if you change the temperature, you can actually add more solute at higher temperatures than you can at lower temperatures. So this is at 20 degrees Celsius. But a different salt, like calcium chloride, for example, can dissolve almost twice as much mass, 745 grams per liter of water. So the saturation point of NaCl and CaCl2 are different because the solutes are different. Now anything that is less than the maximum is considered unsaturated. If you put in more solute than the solvent can handle, and you start to see crystals of the solute kind of build up at the bottom, well then you have what is called oversaturation, which is more than the maximum. There's a special case of saturation that happens very specifically, and it only works with certain solutes. But if you heat up the water to boil, and then you add your solute and saturate at high temperatures, at near boiling temperatures, and then you allow the solution to cool down to regular temperatures, the solute will stay in solution. Now typically the solute as it cools would precipitate out of the liquid as it cools down. But in this certain situation, some solutes can actually stay in solution as it gradually cools. And this is what is referred to as super saturation. Now I'm gonna scroll up here to give myself a little bit more room. But I wanna talk about something that the AP College Board writers of the test like to do. And it's basically set up a scenario and try to decide whether or not a solution is saturated or unsaturated. And they set up a situation. So here's a beaker and it's got 100 milliliters of water in it. And you don't know whether or not it's saturated or unsaturated, but you know that it has salt in it, NaCl. Could be any salt really, but let's for our purposes say it's NaCl and it's held at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Now, the test you can perform is this. Add one more crystal of salt to the solution. If the salt crystal dissolves, then the original solution must have been unsaturated. Makes sense, because it had room to dissolve one more. But if you add one crystal in and it sinks to the bottom and remains undissolved, then the original solution must have been saturated. Now if you take a solution and you don't know if it's saturated or unsaturated and you add a crystal and it drops in and you see what appears to be a magical appearance of many, 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 many crystals, well then what you just did is you just put a crystal into a super saturated solution. Because as soon as you introduce a crystal of the solute to a super saturated solution, it triggers this chain effect that basically causes every solute particle that's super saturated in the solution to come out of solution. And what you see is this cascade of crystals form in the beaker. It's worth noting that sodium chloride cannot supersaturate. It's one of the solutes that will not form a super saturated solution. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the effects that temperature have on solubility. And when it comes to solids, liquids, and gases as solutes, this affects solids, liquids, and gases differently, so pay close attention to the differences. Page 525 in the textbook outlines this concept quite nicely, so it's worth a read. I'm going to make a little table here with solid, liquid, and gas. We're going to talk about the solubility in the liquid for each different one. Let's first talk about solids. When temperature goes up with the solvent, you can dissolve more solute into the solvent. This is true of both solids and liquids. Now the amount that you can dissolve depends on the solute, but for the most part, as temperature of the solvent goes up, more solute can be dissolved up into a certain point. There becomes a point where at even the highest temperatures when no more solute can be dissolved in the solvent. Let's take a look at a graph of solids dissolved and the effects that temperature have. As you can see, as temperature increases along the horizontal axis, you get solubility in grams of salt per 100 grams of water increasing for almost all of these. Now you might be asking yourself, Mr. Call me, what about cesium sulfate here? It actually decreases its solubility as temperature increases, and truthfully, I can't explain that whatsoever. And so, don't think about that one. If somebody comes up with the correct answer, I'd love to hear about it. 
but all the other solids on this table increase. Some look like exponential growth, where others are more linear, but they increase as temperature goes up, and so you can dissolve more solid in water, specifically 100 grams of water, as the temperature increases. Now what about gases? For gases, when it comes to dissolving gases into water or into a solvent, as temperature increases, now you might be asking yourself, why is this true? Why is it opposite for gases compared to solids and liquids? Let's first talk about solids and liquids. Remember, as temperature increases, the space between the particles of the solvent increases, and so increased temperature allows for more pockets of space for those solute particles to wedge themselves into. And as temperature increases of the solvent, more solute can be dissolved. But when it comes to gases, think about gas laws. Remember what happens when temperature goes up for gas? Volume goes up. And when volume goes up, it becomes less dense. And so they are less soluble as the temperature gets warmer. You have larger bubbles of gas trying to fit into those small pockets. And the gas bubbles grow larger than the pockets of space in the solvent. And so you can't really wedge any more gas into those pockets of space in the solvent. And so you get less solubility when it comes to gases, but more solubility as temperature goes up when it comes to solids and liquids. Now gases dissolve in liquids, an example would be carbonated beverages. Warm carbonated beverages release a lot more gas when you open them up compared to when you open up an ice cold. This is a direct example of the ability of a gas to dissolve, or in this case not dissolve, in warmer solvents. Let's take a look at what it looks like graphically. What you're looking at are four different gases and their solubilities as temperature increases. As the temperature increases, you can see that less and less of the gas can be dissolved in the liquid. Helium has the lowest effect. In fact, it's almost flat. But carbon monoxide, you can see an obvious decline. Oxygen, an obvious decline. And CH4 has the largest decline of solubility when it comes to increasing temperature. Let's talk about oxygen dissolved in a liquid. Oxygen is dissolved in water, and this is what fish breathe. Fish are breathing the same oxygen we are. They're just using gills to extract the oxygen from the water compared to lungs that we extract the oxygen from the air. Now, in the hottest days of summer and the water temperature is at its peak, fish are often not found in the shallow waters because the shallow waters are warmer waters, and warmer waters have lower oxygen. It's like if you were up at the top of a mountain, it would be very difficult to breathe. If you are running or doing physical activity in high altitudes, there's less oxygen to breathe, and so you get out of breath much sooner. Fish feel the same effect in warm water. There's less oxygen in the water because the temperature of the water is hotter. So if you're fishing, you want to go to deeper water in the middle of the summer. Now, early in the springtime, when the ice just melts, the temperature of the water is pretty low, and there's lots of oxygen in that water, and the fish are pretty active. In all depths. So depending on the temperature of the water, you want to adjust your fishing hole accordingly. Otherwise, you're going to have some tough luck if you're fishing in shallow, warm water. The last thing I want to talk about in this video lesson are the effects that pressure have on solubility. Now, let's first start with solids and liquids. Solids and liquids are not compressible states of matter and are unaffected by changes in pressure. So because of this, solids and liquids have zero impact on solubility when the pressure changes. Gases, on the other hand, are compressible. And because of this, a high pressure environment drastically changes the ability of a gas to dissolve in a liquid. Under high pressure, you can squeeze more gas into tighter spaces, and thus you can increase the solubility of a gas if you put it under high pressure. So in summary, pressure has no effect on solids and liquids and has a very high effect on gases. Under high pressure, more gas can be dissolved into liquid. Once again, we need to think about the gas laws. Under high pressure, volume is low. And so if you increase the pressure, the gas bubbles get smaller and smaller and smaller, and thus can be put into smaller and smaller spaces in between those solvent particles. Better yet, have a low temperature of that solvent and you can dissolve even more gas because as temperature goes down, volume goes down. As pressure goes down, volume goes down. So both of those working together will result very, very good solubility of gases in a liquid. Well, that takes care of this video lesson. Thanks for watching.